Okay. All right. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It's good to be here again. This is the fourth in our series of uh, these 4-H workshops. Um, I apologize. I'm in Los Angeles now. My mom was in the hospital, so I'm at my parents' house now and my mom's home recovering. Um, but if you hear, um, you know, people coming in and out, I apologize. I've got Laurel and Hardy behind me. My dad is a big Laurel and Hardy fan. So um, for those of you that that remember them, that's uh, that's my dad's sophisticated sense of humor there. Um, uh, anyway, so this is the fourth in our talks. Um, you know, we're going to be talking this morning about common diseases. Um, we're going to be talking about common diseases uh, and predators and their prevention. Um, you know, it's a very important topic. I'm a veterinarian, so I do a lot of stuff with diseases. So, um, and, and sometimes, you know, when it comes to poultry, treating diseases is usually um, almost a fool's errand. It, it doesn't always work very well. So prevention, 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 those are, those are the things we really need to focus on the most. And every once in a while, there's a disease we can treat, but it, it for the most part, you know, when we're dealing with things like Merrick's disease, for example, there's just no treatment. And I'm gonna tell you for the first time and probably for the 10th time in this talk, Apple cider vinegar does, does not treat Merrick's disease, doesn't treat avian influenza, doesn't treat salmonella, um, doesn't treat coccidia. There's no literature that the apple cider vinegar works on anything with respect to poultry diseases. I'm not sure why apple cider vinegar is, is just online considered this kind of panacea. Um, it's not gonna hurt. Well, well hurt if you add too much of it to the water and the chickens don't drink because the water tastes too bitter to them. Um, but just, just be aware, you know, it's, it's, if it's too good to be true, it, it's probably not true. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm not opposed to um, some of the different organic treatments. So oregano oil, for example, there's some really good literature on oregano oil and prevention and or treatment of coccidia, which is a parasite. So I'm not just poo-pawing, you know, anything that, that, that is um, considered like a, a supplement. Uh, it's just apple cider vinegar is, is the one that for some reason, like I said, seems to kind of uh, percolate on the internet quite a bit. And is, uh, as far as I can tell, I have not seen any scientific literature that would support utilizing it for any kind of medical treatment. Um, so I'm very informal, but we're going to save our questions for the end. But, but I really wanted to highlight, you know, the, the most important part of these talks is that we know each other now. So when you ultimately do have questions, and I've mentioned this in our previous talks, when you ultimately do have questions, feel free to email, call, text. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like everyone else. So if I don't uh, respond, just send me another one because um, it just gets sometimes things slip through the cracks. But um, I, I, you guys pay my salary. So um, the least I could do is a, I'm a California employee. Um, so the least I could do is, is try to help you guys out. And uh, we have a, a very deep bench at the University of California. So we have experts um, down in UC Riverside and Davis and, and everywhere in between. And when they don't know, we've got, you know, the way the world works now, we, we can reach out um, outside of California. I, I do enjoy the reality of the way the world works now. I, I get email questions from all over the world. And uh, I, I certainly don't tell people, well, you're not paying taxes in California. Um, I'm not gonna help you. So um, that's, that's, it's a pretty amazing that, that we've got this ability um, to really interface and help people around the world. We take it for granted, but, but that's the way the world works now. Uh, just very briefly, so I'm in uh, UC Cooperative Extension. I'm an associate professor. Uh, my lab works on, we do a lot of disease modeling um, so um, kind of like COVID modeling, but with chicken diseases. Um, so some of you might be aware we're, we're dealing with a huge avian influenza outbreak in North America, unfortunately. And uh, that causes a lot of, um, I guess, heartburn for poultry producers um, and, and potentially for us, because if, if a lot of birds get sick, um, egg prices and meat prices uh, for, for, for poultry meat go up. Um, so we've done a pretty good job, this knock on wood, this, this outbreak, our previous outbreak that we had in 2014 to 2015, not so good a job. 
Um, so we're learning. So that, that's a good thing. And, and what we're going to be talking about today is really how do we prevent those diseases from getting on to our, in, into our birds? Um, and, and what are the things that we should be kind of uh, focusing on? Um, so um, we'll be talking a little about that. Um, I always like to show real life type stuff. So I have three children. Um, and, um, this picture is old, but I, I love this picture. So I'm, I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick it with it until my kids turn 18. So our twins, Isadora and Zephyr are now 12 years old and our youngest Heron is now 10 years old. So, um, and I just love this picture so much. So, um, and I apologize if you've seen some of this stuff before, but just so we're all on the same page, we've got some really, really good resources. I'm biased, but, um, if you go onto our website, if you type in UC Davis and poultry, uh, you'll go onto our website. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple things. We have a YouTube channel now. Um, we have an app. Um, we also have Instagram now. So this is a slightly older picture. So I have a, a graduate student who, um, to her credit, is really into outreach and working with the public. Um, so we have now we have Instagram. And uh, the Instagram is kind of just so you can see, and I think this would be a good thing for, for maybe 4-Hers. What is it like being a graduate student in a, in a lab that works on chickens? Like what, what are the, the good and the bad, the drama, you know, all those type of things um, that, that, that uh, you, know, you maybe don't appreciate, like what, what it's like to be a, a researcher at a, at a big university and um, what people work on. Um, if you go on our website now, we'll have you know all the most relevant information about the uh, avian influenza outbreak that's going across North America right now. Um, hopefully, knock on wood, we're, we're kind of peaking and we're, where things are getting um, are going to start improving soon as waterfowl start moving north of here um, for their uh, summer um, um, breeding. Um, so uh, the other thing I want to highlight, especially for those of us in California, wildfire resources. So um, we're trying to develop an app that'll be hopefully uh, useful for poultry and for um, other goats, sheep, um, um, non-commercial um, um, backyard uh, livestock owners. And that app will give resources on uh, locations for um, uh, dropping off or picking up animals, uh, go bags. And, and the advantage of an app, just very briefly, um, is that uh, when there is a fire, the internet might not be working. But apps, if the way we can construct them, all, a lot of information can be embedded in the app. So um, the idea is to have the app there because it, it'll be much more... Uh, structurally um, um, available as opposed to the internet, which during uh, wildfires, floods, and things like that might not be available. Um, so I, I encourage you right now, the app is not built, um, but we're trying to get some funding um, to work on that. And we have, I think, some good ideas and, and it's my job to, to get those to get those dollars so we can build that for the public. I've failed so far, but but um, I'm stubborn about these type of things. That's part of being a good researcher is, is knowing to keep on revising grants so you can get the funds to do these type of things. Um, and I wanted to kind of highlight, we have a new YouTube series called The Sitch. Um, and just very briefly, it's a monthly video that comes out on all the different topics that, that people ask me about. It's on YouTube. You can subscribe to it. We're inching forward closer to 400 or so subscribers. Um, but the videos basically just highlight some, um, we have three rules of the video. Number one, uh, no uh, fancy word. I have a no fancy word pledge. Uh, number two, the video has to be three minutes or shorter. I'm, I'm a hypocrite on that. It's typically about five minutes or shorter. Um, and number three, I have to have at least one chicken joke or chicken pun in there. So um, hopefully that's uh, entertaining to you. And then uh, very briefly, who to contact in case of a poultry emergency. So if you go into our website, um, we've spent some time recently really working on this and, and trying to make it a little more organized. But if you go into the resources tab, um, you'll find or, or find an expert up here. Uh, this, if you scroll down from this page here, you can find all the different um, experts. I can certainly help you with all these questions, but, but there are people um, that are really experts. So if you have, for example, a question on ectoparasites, I, I should be able to help, but 
Um, if you really want, if you ask a complicated question and, and you want to talk to you know the horse, the horse's mouth per se, uh, Dr. Geary at UC Riverside is is an expert also. Uh, Richard Blatchford, um, some of you might know a little. So he's a, a professor over in animal science at UC Davis. He's outstanding. Um, and I think at some point, hopefully we'll get him involved in the series as we continue to, to, to deliver um, these, type of, um, these type of resources. Um, so I apologize if you've heard that before. Um, just one more kind of slide here. We've got some newsletters here um, and uh, they come out quarterly. You go onto our website, you can enroll in them. If you can't find them, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the link for enrolling. Um, but, um, you know, there's little puzzles in here. Um, here's, you know, some, we just recently got a, a four year million dollar grant to work on virulent Newcastle disease, disease modeling. We're also making a documentary and making an app and, and things like that. Um, so you can read about what we're doing and, and um, hopefully that's of interest and relevant and all those good things. And then we have a, uh, another newsletter just for cooperative extension in general at the, at the School of Vet Med with a focus not just on poultry, but on uh, livestock and, 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 and things like that. So, um, so routes of disease transmission. So, um, you know, as an epidemiologist and a veterinarian, this is, you know, kind of when I talk to graduate students uh, in epidemiology, um, this is a slide that I'll show them um, because you want to start, you know, kind of to understand what the risks are. And I just want to make a point here. So fighting birds, um, you might say, like, I, I don't know anyone that fights birds. You might say, I, I, I don't interact with anyone that fights birds. That might be well and true. But the reality is, is that uh, your birds, which are pet birds, maybe, uh, and, and fighting birds, you go to probably some of the same locations, auctions, pet stores, feed stores, for example, shows. Um, and, and the reality is, is that virus like Newcastle disease, um, like Merrick's disease, bacteria like salmonella, um, internal parasites and ex external parasites, they can be transferred and left in, in just kicked on dirt and, and, and schmutz um, that, that can be left at these places. And then if you don't practice good biosecurity, you can, you can take that, those diseases home with you. And that's how disease spreads. We know that from, from COVID, for example, and it's very common in poultry. And unfortunately, this humans are just very, we're active, right? We, we bounce around the place. And, and humans are probably the main source of how diseases are transmitted. Uh, between uh, pet birds and pet birds, or pet birds and fighting birds, or commercial birds and, and pet birds. So it's just really important to recognize that. And, and how can we stop, break that cycle of disease transmission? The simplest thing we can do, and we'll talk about it, is good biosecurity, right? That's, that's the basics. And I think we know that intuitively. The other way that disease gets spread is through wildlife. Um, so snakes are, are you know, very common carrying salmonella poop from wild animals, all kinds of bacteria and viruses there. Uh, here you can see some waterfowl um, that obviously are the main reservoir of avian influenza. Um, so predators and wildlife are, are kind of a, a, a two for one risk. Uh, they can obviously, if they're predators, they can, they can kill our chickens. Um, even if they're not predators though, they can transmit disease. So that's why it's important uh, for us to practice good biosecurity. Um, these are from some GoPro cameras we set up, and, and this kind of gives you an idea of which, what we're up against as far as, uh, as far as disease and predators and things like that. If we know what we're up against, you know, I would have never predicted we, we had to deal with snakes. So obviously, you know, hardware cloth is not really going to help us too much with snakes and, and, unless we get a real fine mesh hardware cloth. But um, it's nice to know what you're up against, um, it's, and, it, and it can help you with your predator control, and it can help you with your disease control. Um, here you can see at night, a rabbit, a cats, for example. So I'm a sucker for technology, so I like doing these things. Um, I like sharing this, especially with, I think, 4-H folks, because I think the 4-H kind of culture is usually very kind of into innovation and trying things out and, and, and kind of sharing that. Um, so I think that's an important thing to at least get across it. You, you can do, you can, the sky's the limit. Here you can see that barn in the background here from our GoPro camera, for example. 
um, diseases. So uh, the CAFS lab, the, we have this amazing diagnostic lab. And if people are ever interested in, in tours, I can certainly probably arrange something. So um, the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab is this lab that we have four of them in the state. Uh, we used to have more, but we still have the four. Uh, one in Davis, um, one in Turlock, just south of Davis, one in Tulare, just south of Turlock, and then one down in Riverside. And uh, the lab system is great. So you, if you have a sick chicken or a dead chicken and you don't know how it died um, and you want to figure out why it died in order to protect the rest of your flock, um, the commercial poultry industry, backyard folks, they'll submit their birds to the CAFS lab uh, for $20. They will get, in many cases, thousands of dollars of diagnostic work to figure out was it a viral disease? Was it a bacterial disease? Parasitic? Parasitic? Was it a nutritional disease? Toxin? Was there a lead issue, for example? All those type of things um, we can we can um, answer at the CAFS lab. And and like I said, these are very highly trained veterinary pathologists. And for those twenty dollars, you know, we can we can do all kinds of they can do all kinds of of disease surveillance. Uh, very briefly, if we're looking at common viral diseases, and, and I just want to make a point here, the most common viral disease is Merrick's disease. So um, I'm going to tell you a joke I probably told you before. I had a veterinary, my veterinary virology professor when I was in vet school, probably 15 years ago now, something like that. Um, he had a joke that there's two things you can never get rid of. Uh, one is Merrick's disease. It's a, it, one, one is a herpes virus, which is Merrick's disease is a type of herpes virus. And the second one is land in Pullman, Washington. So he said, I only have one of those. I'm not gonna tell you which one, but Merrick's disease, ubiquitous. Wherever you have chickens, you have Merrick's disease. So the reality is, unless you control the biosecurity and unless you vaccinate, um, if you don't do those two things, you're chickens are probably going to get Merrick's disease. And as you can see here, this is the number one cause of mortality with respect to viruses in backyard birds. And if we look at top backyard poultry diseases, and I would, this is just for California, but if I was a betting man, I would bet this is the very similar around the world. This is the number one cause of diseases in backyard, of death, mortality in backyard chickens. Now, commercial birds, they vaccinate. They are very, very good at the Mer at, at vaccinating all chicks against Merrick's disease virus. Backyard, not so much. Um, actually, they're terrible. So backyard are better at other things, but definitely not vaccination. So when I look at this, I, I'm a relatively positive person. When I look at this, I'm like, okay, if we keep on encouraging backyard owners to get the Merrick's disease vaccine, which is pennies on the dollar, which hatcheries should be doing. They don't do because people don't demand it, but really easy to give all those good things. So if we start encouraging our hatcheries around the United States to do it, then this can be literally cut in half. I mean, th th this is this is easy. This is low hanging fruit that we should be working on very, very easily. And it's, it's in the commercial poultry world, we don't really have Merrick's disease issues. So the potential to eliminate this uh, or to at least reduce it significantly is really there. Um, but I want to talk a little about Merrick's disease because the prevention is really easy. Um, we just need to focus on vaccination and we need to focus on getting rid of feather dander. So if I take a chicken that's vaccinated um, at day of age and I take that chick and I put it in an area with a lot of feather dander from a previous flock, for example, those feather follicles um, have a ton of virus that's present in that follicle. Um, so it's like taking someone that has a COVID vaccine and saying, ah, eh, you're fine. And then putting them in an environment with just a ton of COVID, right? It, where the vaccines aren't perfect, right? We know that um, from, from COVID and other things. So it's really important to do those two things. Make sure we have good husbandry. So we've gotten rid of all the feather follicles and dander and dust where that virus might be kind of floating around. And to make sure our chicks are, are vaccinated at day one of age against the Merrick's vaccine. Those are the two biggies. If you're gonna remember two things on this talk, talking about backyard poultry diseases, remember, remember those two. One, we always wanna vaccinate our chicks against Merrick's, and two, we wanna get rid of all the feather dander when we introduce our birds into any poultry environment.
If we can do those two, this number is going to come down a ton. Um, so vaccines to, uh, vaccines to consider in backyard poultry, uh, the biggie is merits, okay? There are some folks um, that will that will say that there are some breeds of chicken that have Merrick's disease. Um, that there's some that there's some genes that that will that will give them some um, genetic um, uh, advantage against Merrick's disease. Partially true until we get a little further on in the research on that, which breeds and stuff like that. Just just give the Merrick's vaccine. I'll answer questions at the end because I think they want to record this. So, um, but I, I saw someone's question. Um, for what vaccines, so, so always Merrick's disease, in, in my opinion, and I think that's kind of, I th if I had to summarize where, you know, 90, nine out of 10 poultry veterinarians are, it would probably be more like 999 out of 1,000. Um, there are some that would disagree with that, but, but we're, we can, I can argue with them on the side, but that would be, like I, like I said, the general recommendation. It depends on Newcastle disease vaccine, dry pox, and salmonella and teriditis. So those are the ones um, if we're in Southern California, my general recommendation is to give the Newcastle vaccine, the Lasota vaccine, as an eyedropper. Now, the only time I do not recommend it, if you go to poultry shows um, or if you go to game fowl events, which is kind of a euphemism for fighting events, my, I'm a disease modeler. My recommendation is not to give the Newcastle vaccine if you go to, to, go to shows because um, if birds are vaccinated, against Newcastle vaccine, they can still become infectious and they can still spread the virus asymptomatically. So, um, and some people disagree with me on this, but we've done some disease modeling and I'm fairly confident based upon the literature and we, we keep on working on this because to me, this is a really important distinction. If your backyard birds are just backyard birds, 100% vaccinate them. But if you go to shows, um, now you run the risk of having asymptomatic spread of Newcastle disease. If you have sick birds, you don't take them to a show, but if your birds are healthy or they appear healthy, but they've been infected with Newcastle disease, do not take them to a show and you wouldn't know that. So my sense is, my recommendation is, if your birds stay in the backyard and they never go to shows, vaccinate them. If you take them to a show, don't vaccinate them against Newcastle disease. So hopefully that makes some sense. Dry pox, we'll talk about just for a few minutes, but um, dry pox, I only recommend vaccinating against dry pox if you have a known risk of dry pox. Dry pox doesn't cause a lot of mortality. So if you have it, you can actually give the vaccine in the face of an outbreak. Um, it's not gonna kill a lot of chickens. They're just gonna get these ugly scabs on their kind of mucous membranes and comb and stuff like that. Um, so if you have it, then we'll deal with it. Um, and then Salmonella enteritidis, um, that's the most common uh, type of Salmonella associated with poultry that causes foodborne illness. So if you ever, um, you know, kind of whenever there's an outbreak of Salmonella and it's associated with poultry, it's either Salmonella enteritidis or it can be uh, Salmonella pylorum or it can be Salmonella Heidelberg. You know, there's a few that are relatively common but we do have an enteritidis vaccine. We do use that in all of California's commercial layers. It works okay, it's not perfect, but, but it helps a little, so um, I'm not opposed to it. If, for example, let's say you have young children, um, or let's say you have someone immunocompromised or someone older in your home, you wanna be a little more cautious, or if you give your eggs to your neighbors and then you know, you're just afraid that, uh, you know, someone's going to sue you eventually, at the minimum, you could say, well, I, I vaccinate my birds, I do all this husbandry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we don't uh, usually give, the coccidia vaccine, cock, um, um, uh, what is it? coccivac, uh, we don't usually give that. We don't usually give the infectious bronchitis vaccine. I'm not, not going to go into why we don't, but it's more of a more specialty. And then we never give the um, vaccines in backyard birds um, for avian influenza or for infectious laryngeotracheitis. And uh, we can talk about that later, why, why that's so in the interest of time. Um, I'm not gonna go over too much on vaccinations, but here is kind of how you give the virulent Newcastle disease vaccine as just an eyedropper. You can give it other ways too, but the eyedropper 
in a small flock is the best way to deliver the vaccine. Now, can I put it in their water also? I can, but, but now there's not a, um, a 100%, you know, kind of sense that I'm getting the vaccine to every single bird, you know, all five of my birds, all 10 of my birds. So um, there's some nice videos online about that, um, which I can share with people if they're interested. Um, but the only other thing um, I wanted to mention about vaccines just in general, only vaccinate healthy birds. So I, I think we know that intuitively with, our, with ourselves and our children and things like that. Um, and the last thing about vaccines, you can see some of the tidbits here, but make sure when you're vaccinating birds, do it early in the morning. Um, you don't want to do it when the sun's out because some vaccines can get inactivated and um, they, they as, as the saying goes, vaccination is very easy. Immunization is hard. So giving the vaccine, very easy, right? Eyedropper, or needle, whatever it is, that's not hard. The hard part is getting an immune response, right? So, um, and the only way we get a good immune response is by following all these directions, right? So sometimes, like if you're in Africa or Asia, or, you know, Southern California in the summer, and you're like, eh, it's two o'clock on a Saturday, it's, 100, it's 115 degrees outside, ah, I'm gonna vaccinate my birds, right? And then, you know, someone calls you on a cell phone and you're talking and the sun is just beating down on the vaccine, vaccine's not gonna work, right? You vaccinate the birds, but you're not gonna get an immune response. So as the saying goes, again, just, just be thoughtful when you're giving the vaccine about doing it when it's cool, usually in the morning. If you put it in the water, you can take the water away at night so they get a little thirsty. So in the morning, in theory, whenever I take students to do this, they, they don't participate, they don't follow my, um, what I try to get them to do. But, but if you do deprive them of water to get them a little thirsty, then they'll, they'll lap it up in, in the morning. So there are different ways to do it. Um, and I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but, but we can, you know, in the future, spend a, a whole probably hour just on vaccination practices and how to give medicines and things like that. Um, Merrick's disease, so uh, very contagious, number one cause of backyard poultry mortality in California and beyond, if I had to guess. Um, like I said, anywhere you have chickens, you've got that herpes virus, the Merrick's disease herpes virus, herpes virus. It causes tumors. Kind of from a historical perspective, people are very excited when they first figured out that the vi a virus causes cancer. Um, because then people started thinking like, oh, okay, if we can give vaccines against cancer, then we can treat cancer. And there are more cancers that are viral in animals as opposed to humans. So there are some cancers, um, uh, human um, um, uh, cervical cancer, for example, is caused by a, a virus, um, but uh, most viruses in humans are not caused, as far as we know, are not caused by, um, in, are not caused by infectious viruses, for example. Um, I did want to point out, um, Merrick's disease, I'll, I'll get you know, a good couple of emails a week from people asking um, why their uh, chicken is lame, for example. So the classical sign of Merrick's disease is like a six month to a year old, sometimes older, sometimes a little younger uh, chicken that is unable to move. So usually people will send me an email saying, my, my chicken's not hungry. And I'll say, well, how do you know it's not hungry? And it's like, well, it's not going to its feeder. And I go, is it not going to its feeder because it's not hungry? Or is it not going to its feeder because it can't move very well? And usually that, you know, when you start asking them and they're like, oh, it's not moving very well, but I don't see any fractures or anything. So the most common clinical sign with Merrick's disease, if you're in, when I talk to vet students, I always tell them, and they're studying for their board so they can become veterinarians. This is like one of the more common board questions. So you'll, you'll know that question now. Um, you know, what's the most common source of, uh, of, of uh, a chicken um, being lame um, from, a, from a disease, you know, from a viral disease perspective? And, and you've got these multiple choices and, and Merrick's disease ends up being that one. So I always tell students, like, I know you got a million things to memorize, but when it comes to chickens, just remember Merrick's disease and avian influenza. And you'll probably get those two questions right on your boards and then you'll, you'll be a doctor and then you can forget all your chicken stuff if, if you uh, decide to. But these birds are lame, right? Um, and, and there's no way to treat it. And I'm not a pathologist, but if you look here, that's the sciatic nerve. And that sciatic nerve is enlarged because there's a tumor in that nerve. 
Um, and, and that's why they, they're lame. Now, sometimes you'll see their eyes, they'll have kind of a blue tinge to it. Um, there's a couple other clinical signs, but if you can kind of stick with the lameness one, um, that's very, very common. I was just dealing with a, a, a woman last night on an email that was asking this kind of question. And she, she's like, there's no fractures. So, and, and, and the bird was like a year old and, and they weren't vaccinated. So I'm like, yep, that's probably Merrick's disease. Um, so no treatment, including apple cider vinegar for, for Merrick's disease. So the best thing you can do, two things, right? Uh, vaccination. Um, and, um, number two, get rid of all that feather dander, right? Cause that feather dander, um, will, will kind of concentrate from, from your other flock will concentrate the virus. So again, don't, don't put your birds in an environment with tons of virus. There's always going to be some virus there. You just want to reduce the amount of virus there. Um, work with your uh, hatchery or your pet store. So I always get a little frustrated when uh, some pet stores um, just don't even offer it. And, and I've, I've talked to some owners that, they're, that, that the pet stores kind of just don't, you know, or the, or the hatchery doesn't even know what they're talking about. So I always, in my opinion, when they, when they don't give the vaccine, when they don't go that extra mile to give that vaccine, which is literally less than a penny per bird, if they're not gonna do that, I always wonder where else they're gonna cut corners. So is it, in good litter? Is it, you know, in, in some of the other practices, are they smooshing the birds in um, and, and spreading other diseases? Like if you can't give the Merrick's vaccine in day old chicks, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to question everything else at, at a certain level, just, just to, uh, cause to me, that's, if, if the birds are all dying of that, why aren't they doing that? So now if I tell them that they're going to ignore me cause I'm not buying any chicks from that. But if you guys tell them that, um, then, then they will probably, if I had to guess, be a little more, um, compliant. Um, so the vaccine is really easy to give. So if you hatch your own birds, you can get a bottle of the vaccine and reconstitute it. And then you just give a 10th of a CC underneath the skin at day one of age. If you do it after day one of age, it, it, it's not going to hurt, but it's not going to help. The dogma is that the vaccine, that the virus is already in, in the environment and in the birds um, very, very quickly. So in the commercial world, we'll vaccinate in novo. We'll vaccinate while those birds are still in their embryos, in, the, in their egg. Um, we don't do that in, in the backyard world just because that the, um, the injectors are, are a little expensive and, and most, if not all, um, backyard non-commercial hatcheries um, don't don't have that technology, but it, it's certainly there. And and the next best thing is just to give the vaccine at day of age. Um, so regardless of vaccine status, the one thing I really wanted to, to highlight is um, you always want to get rid of those that feather dander. That that's that's key, right? And if you hatch your own eggs, you can buy the vaccine. The dosage, the smallest bottle uh, dosage is five hundred birds. Um, that being said, the bottle is maybe $30 or so. So it, it's, you know, even if you have to vaccinate five birds, you can't save the vaccine. So it's, it's, it's wasteful um, for whatever reason. And I'm not an, a regulatory veterinarian, but for whatever reason, if a company has a bottle like Fort Dodge, Pfizer, whatever, has a bottle that's for 500 doses, if they want to make a bottle for 50 doses, they have to go through some big rigmarole of approval and things like that. It's not trivial. It's not just making like a smaller, you know, kind of fun size of a, of a, of a chocolate bar or something like that. It just for some reason that doesn't work. So, um, so it, it, it hasn't become economically viable for anyone to do that. So I have asked a couple of vaccine companies why they don't do that. It's just not a, not a thing yet. Um, so, uh, we've had Newcastle disease in Southern California and it, it has moved into Northern California. It has moved into other States it, just because of how interactive people are trading birds. Um, people, um, are bringing birds to shows. So we, our most recent Newcastle disease outbreak was centered in Southern California, like previous outbreaks have been centered, but it is moving into other parts of the state and other parts of the U.S. because of uh, the, the way that we trade birds now, Craigslist and things like that. Um, so it's just really important to be aware of that, especially if you're in Southern California. The most recent outbreak was between 2018 and 2020. Um, so I would highly encourage uh, folks, especially in Southern California, to make sure their birds are vaccinated 
And that means one vaccine um, a year, and then just keep boosting them every single year. During an outbreak, uh, we give two vaccines um, every six months um, um, is, is, is during an outbreak. Uh, this is this twisted neck. Um, so sometimes you won't see anything, um, but sometimes one of the clinical signs you'll see is a bird with a twisted neck. Now, that being said, when I talk to, to some of the old timers and I ask them like, have you actually seen this? And they're like, just in the books, right? So just, just because your chicken doesn't have this twisted neck and is, 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 is dead, doesn't mean they don't have Newcastle disease. And Newcastle disease is one of those things where Newcastle disease and avian influenza, if you've got a lot of birds, let's say you have 10 birds and seven of them die, you're probably dealing with something like that um, potentially. So that's when you need to call folks like myself or folks like the California Department of Food and Agriculture. This California sick bird hotline is set up. So they'll bring veterinarians out there to see and to test if, if we're dealing with one of these type of diseases, avian influenza or Newcastle disease. But you can also submit to the calves out. In fact, you know, when I said earlier, sometimes they'll do thousands of dollars of work. So someone might be like, why is the state of California doing that? And, and they're only getting $20. The whole reason is to protect our commercial poultry. So if we have Newcastle disease and we don't catch that early, from an economic perspective, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars now. So it's an investment in, in our food security, in the, in the, in the businesses um, that, that have poultry in, the, in California and beyond. So to me, this used to be free. And they were kind of a victim of their own success. But to me, from a disease perspective, and if you talk to an ag economist, you could justify this very easily on the back of an envelope, in my mind. Uh, control of Newcastle disease, biosecurity, 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 apple cider vinegar doesn't work. You can vaccinate, but remember, if you go to shows, my own feeling is I want to know that those birds are sick. So don't vaccinate and then bring your bird to a show because you could be asymptomatically spreading the disease. And that, that's my opinion. I know there's another virologist that uh, we disagree a little on that, but um, you know we can have that discussion offline. Um, that B1 or Lasota vaccine is, is, is the vaccine that you would use in your birds. Um, I like to vaccinate every six months, but, but the general recommendation is do it at least once a year. So. Um, I think we all know that vaccination is a little little art, more art than science sometimes. And, and, and as we get you know better at the epidemiology and understanding titers and what we call correlates of protection and things like that, we, we, we get a little more dialed in on, on the exact method of, of, uh, of vaccination. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but this is just the, this is one of our, I have a grad student. Um, so one of my grad students does a lot of disease modeling and, and, and more than anything, it just shows that asymptomatic spread is, is a real problem. So I'm not gonna go into, into that too much. Um, in general, vaccination is never a substitute for good biosecurity. So I think sometimes people, um, especially before COVID, I think saw vaccination as this panacea, which it's just not, it's part of good management, but it's, it's by no means the end all be all. Um, dry pox, very common disease. Um, it, it, it I love dry pox in the sense that sometimes people send me pictures of, of all kinds of things. And I'm like, there, there's, I, I can't tell you what disease it is. You need to submit it to the CAFS lab and then we can talk. Dry pox, very common. And, and if I see this, I'm like, yep, that's probably dry pox. We, we don't have to submit that bird to the CAFS lab. Um, it, it looks ugly. Uh, the virus, don't, don't scrape those scabs off and then touch other birds because there's like a gazillion and one viral particles in there. So um, just let the scabs kind of be there. Um, but um, it's not a horrible disease. In the commercial world, it's, it's not so good because it, it causes re reductions in eggs. Um, and that's how farmers get paid, right? If they're not producing eggs, then, then they're just paying for feed and, and now they're going to go out of business. In the backyard world, um, it just looks ugly. And uh, the prevention is, uh, the virus is typically spread by mosquitoes. So mosquito control is really key. So um, all the you know, gutters and tires, things that can kind of pool water, get rid of those. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, when you do vaccinate them, I, I, I would, if you have a dry pox issue, you want to vaccinate annually. Um, but uh, fully recovered birds do not appear to be carriers, which is very rare in poultry like that usually, 
when we have mycoplasma or Merix or, or whatever, they're carriers for life. Um, but, but for the literature right now, it says that, that fully recovered birds are not carriers. Uh, vaccination for dry pox, just very briefly. Um, we usually vaccinate um, two different types of vaccines, a pigeon pox and a fowl pox. And I love vaccinating for dry pox and some people hate it. It just depends. So you have this two prong applicator. You guys can do this, it's very simple. You dip those two prongs into the mixture. You have like a Petri dish and you have the pigeon pox and the fowl pox mixed in into like a Petri dish. And then you dip this thing into there and then you puncture their wing. And, and I can show you uh, a, a, a nice, easy way to do that. But it's a, to me, it's very satisfying pun puncturing that through the wing. Some people hate that, but to me, I, I get, it's just a relaxing, not, not relaxing, but it's just kind of a nice thing to do. And then seven to 10 days later, you look for what's called a take. And that's where this is. Just make sure I'm a righty. So I, I make sure I'm always vaccinating their left wing. So then I'm using my right arm to vaccinate. I'm stretching that wing out and then vaccinating. And I've got their legs and kind of my armpit area. And it's easier to see, but um, I can show you how to have people how to do that if they're really keen on, on learning. Coccidia, very, very common, just as common as, um, as Merrick's disease. This is a protozoal parasite. Um, very common, um, causes a lot of GI problems, diarrhea, young birds. So if you see a young bird that's kind of got, it's just looking weak, it's got diarrhea, ruffled feathers, it's losing weight, all those type of things, it's coccidia until proven otherwise. And what I recommend for, first of all, is having good husbandry. So that means around your waters and things like that, you don't want spilled water and just moisture and stuff like that. That allows that, that coccidia, those protozoal parasites to kind of persist in the environment, they're always going to be there. It's kind of like Merrick's. So they're just always going to be there, but we just want to reduce the level of them. So making sure that we have a nice, clean environment, uh, including a dry environment um, this time of year when we start getting, well, when we're, when we're finishing up the rainy season, in theory, um, it becomes less of a, of a risk. But especially in the winter, all that moisture really helps um, Imeria to cycle uh, this fecal oral cycle persist. So I would really concentrate on, on the husbandry and um, make sure in your chicks, you're using a, a, what we call a medicated feed. Now the coccidia stat, that's, that's we're keeping, we're not killing all of the coccidia, we're just keeping them under control, it is not an antibiotic. So I highly, highly recommend in, in, in birds um, using a starter feed that has a coccidia stat in it um, because um, that will help kill and control the coccidia levels in the birds so we don't get that diarrhea, ruffled feathers, all those type of things. If, if you are organic, so organic producers cannot use coccidia stats, even though they're not antibiotics, um, organic producers can't use them. So if, if you are an organic producer, you just have to have good husbandry and they do just as well. Um, I prefer to use a coccidia stat um, and I'm, you know, not, I, I don't want to use antibiotics willy nilly, but this is not an antibiotic. This doesn't have any of the risks that antibiotics have. Um, and you can see kind of what the gut looks like. I want to wrap up in the next couple of minutes because I want to ask, um, make sure so I've got about five more minutes and then we're going to ask people what they want to hear potentially for our next um, workshop series. Because we're just about to finish up these four um, workshops and I want to make sure that we have um, people's input on what the next four workshops are. Um, so, um, very briefly, uh, coccidia is um, primarily seen in young birds. If you have diarrhea and things like that, you can, you can get an over-the-counter coccidia stat at a feed store. Um, so, that's very easy to get. Um, I, I am very, you know, I try to be very thorough about diagnosing before we treat. But if we have a, a bird that's between three and six years, three and six weeks of age, and it's got this mucoid uh, diarrhea, dehydrated, and it's weak. I'm like, that's coccidia. We, we don't need, in my opinion, we don't need to go to the veterinarian. We can treat. And, and you can actually, this is one, there's a coccidia stack called amprolium that you can get at the feed store that, that works very effectively that you can stick in their water. Um, so um, I, I don't want to 
go off into this too much. I did want to mention Salmonella enteritidis because it's just, it's somewhat common. It's rare, but it, it happens. And, uh, you know, it's really important to focus on, on good, good husbandry. And when we think about husbandry, I apologize for this, when we think about husbandry, um, let's see here, I'll answer that question in a little. When we think about husbandry and biosecurity, this, and I, I think I've shown this in the past, this is a, a backyard I went to a few years ago, um, but, but biosecurity is key to disease prevention. And I wanna spend a couple minutes on this slide before I show one or two slides on wildlife control, and then we answer some questions. Number one, what I really like about this, this house is that it is completely secure. So a lot of people have fencing, but they don't have a roof to prevent rodents, wildlife, birds, et cetera, et cetera, from coming in. So that's really important for predator control. That's really important for, for biosecurity. Number two is um, you can't see it here, but hardware cloth is gonna be your best friend. So quarter inch hardware cloth is really, really good. Don't use chicken wire. Chicken wire is very weak. Um, and, and most animals are strong enough to kind of finagle their way into a house um, if, it's, if it's protected by chicken wire. Hardware cloth is great. Bury it six inches underneath the ground and use gravel. Rodents do not like to dig through gravel to, to kind of um, bury that hardware cloth. Hardware cloth is very, very hard to work with though. Um, so those of you that have worked with it in the past know what I'm talking about. You'll use wire cutters and it'll, scra it'll scratch you up. So try to use long sleeve shirts, be, wear, wear facial protection, goggles, things like that. It's going to cause problems, so it's, it's, it's a pain to work with, but it's great stuff, and very strong. Um, make sure, you know, this, this house was in uh, east of Sacramento in a beautiful area, but it was hot out there, so they had this nice oak tree for shade. But make sure that uh, roof rats like to jump about three feet, three to four feet, so make sure that you trim the branches so roof rats can't jump onto the roof here and then figure out a way to get inside. So... Um, the other thing to make sure uh, is to make sure spilled feed um, does not um, kind of act as a magnet for wildlife. So uh, these um, is so fundamental from a biosecurity perspective. When you want to protect against predators and disease, this is this is the basics. Okay, even above vaccines, I would say, um, or complementary to vaccines. You know, sometimes people, I think we, as humans, we like to get fancy and no one wants to talk about fencing as we're like, yeah, 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 I know about fencing. No one wants to talk about gravel. No one wants to talk about spilled feed or trimming branches. People just don't want to talk about that stuff. But the reality is, is that we need that kind of stuff. And if we have, we need a sick pen. So if we have a sick bird in here, we have a, a fighting chance if we take that bird and put it in isolation to protect the rest of the flock. So very rarely do people have something where they can stick a sick bird until we figure out what's going on with it. Rodent control is key. So these are tin cats. I promise you, if you have backyard chickens, you have rodents, that's okay. But just make sure you've got some way of trapping rodents. And one of the ways to control for rodents is to make sure you have no habitat around this coop area. So that by, what I mean by habitat is having bushes or trash Mice and rodents will have nesting grounds within 30 to 60 feet of their kind of area that they're exploring for feed and water. So try to make sure in a perfect world, it's hard in an urban environment, that you have a 30 to 60 foot buffer around your coop that doesn't have any um, that doesn't have any potential habitat areas. So this person did a great job. Uh, also for wildfire control, this person did a good job. But you can see this ivy here. If we let that go, that 100% is gonna be good habitat for rodents eventually. Um, having personal protection, having good equipment. We talked earlier about when you go to a feed store, don't ever go to um, a feed store with your regular clothes and then come back to your coop. So um, you don't need to spend money on, on coveralls and, and those type of things, but just have clothing that is 100% dedicated to your coop. So you're not going to the feed store potentially bringing back disease to your chickens um, by, by not changing into uh, whatever old pair of genes you have, for example, right? So think like the virus, think like the disease and, and think about what's the worst case scenario, right? I'm going to my neighbor's 
uh, or down the street to pick up some equipment from them because I don't have a water. Like, first of all, you better make sure that equipment's disinfected. Second of all, make sure you're not wearing the same clothes when you go back to, to your coop because that is that is how it gets done. That's how disease gets transmitted, right? Um, so having all these types of things is really, really, really important. Um, you know, restricting access to feed, easier said than done, uh, speed feed spills. If rodents would just eat the feed and not poop in the feed, I, I might be willing to give them some of the feed. But when they poop in the feed, the chickens eat the poop and that's how disease gets transmitted. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the differences between mice and rats, but um, there's a great website that I really like a lot um, called Motomco, M-O-T-O-M-C-O. And they've got all the basics of like rats versus mice and, and all the different traps that are, that are existing, all the different poisons, some that are environmentally friendly, some that get used by organic producers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I'm um, not gonna check too much about traps because that Matomka website does a good job and I wanna leave some time and I apologize um, for, um, for, our other, for our other discussions. The last thing I just wanna point out, when it comes to predators, if anyone ever tells you like, oh, get this thing, it works against everything, right? Um, you know, sometimes there's an electronic thing or whatever it is, don't trust them. Nothing's perfect. Um, biosecurity, fencing, that's your friend, okay? Um, and, and no one wants to talk about the basics of fencing, but the reality is if you walk around your property and there's a gap in a fence, you better best believe a coyote or a rodent or whatever it is, a raccoon is going to find that same gap. They're smarter than we are. This is what they do for a living. So just make sure the basics are done before you start focusing on a repellent tape, these, these fox and coyote decoys, which I like, they're fun because it's fun to scare grad students, um, but, but they don't work very well unless you move them constantly. Um, but, but fencing is, is, the, is the key. Electric fencing is pretty good too. You know, it gives a little zap, keeps the birds inside a little, um, depending on, on what your situation is. Um, so with that, um, I want to um, um, switch back to Rebecca because I know she has some questions um, that she wants to ask people about potentially future talks.